I'd like to read in the book of Isaiah, first of all, the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53, and we will just read verse number five. <clears throat> Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Over to the Gospel of Mark, please, in chapter number five. Mark five, and reading at verse 15, just breaking into this amazing event that took place in the life of Christ. Mark five and 15. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were, and they were and they that say that told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray the Lord Jesus. They began to pray him to depart out of their coast. And when he was coming to the ship, <clears throat> he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. How be it? Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee, and how he hath compassion on thee. He departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. All men. I've been interested in just a little study, and it is the number of gospel preaching messages we have in the New Testament. And the various things that different people preach, whether it's people as famous and well-known as someone like Paul, Peter, or even someone as maybe unknown as this man. Because it says that he went home and began to publish and declare, and this was his message, what great things Jesus had done for him. Now, I am a visitor here. It is my first time on the East Coast. That's what I would like to do today. I would like to tell you, and I hope I can do it in a simple way, because I would like to make the emphasis just what this verse says. I want to tell you what great things Lord Jesus has done for me. And to tell you that story, I'll have to tell you a little bit about my background and my family. You see, I, I uh, come from the country of India. I was born there. My family moved here when I was just a year and a half. But sometimes we were just... Um, the Lord has opened up a way to meet with people in home, 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 Jackson. And we were meeting with a family. And sometimes people think that uh, people who come to the Bible and share the gospel, they've always been doing this. Like, that's just what they do or something like that. And they maybe don't really, 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 we just stopped and we took a moment to explain how we became Christians. And a lot of people don't really realize that there was a time where this was a meeting that I would have run away from. There was a time where I would not have wanted to be in the seats that you are in. And thanks for being here. Don't you run away. But there was a time where I had no real interest in the gospel. I, I was not interested in spiritual things, and I could never, never have imagined ever preaching. But uh, here we are. And I would like to tell you a little bit about how that happened. In the country of India, my great-great-grandfather, and if you don't know what all these terminology these terms mean that's okay but he was a hindu and he was a brahmin hindu so in simple terms that means he was a very strict hindu uh, of the strictest sect very and uh this is my great great grandfather so going back a couple of generations and uh basically his belief was no different than many people who are religious he believed that through doing certain rites ceremonies observances he would come to a place where he would be found pleasing to God or the gods that he believed in. He was doing these things to show that he loved God. And uh, some of them were very intense, and I don't want to go into all of them, but he was a Brahmin. If you wanted to, you could look it up and see some of the things they do. Very religious, very committed, very devoted. Anyway, there was a missionary that visited his house and knocked on his door. door and... Uh, my great-great-grandfather, as a Brahmin Hindu, was a very proud man as well. And he had no time for a missionary. This missionary did not look like me. He looked more like 
Mr. Higgins. You get my drift. And uh, that's what he thought about Christianity. White man's religion. Far from the truth, but nonetheless, that's what he thought. Well, he opened the door. He was a nice enough man to talk to him. But the moment he wanted to share the gospel, the missionary said, I have no time for that. And quite rudely, as far as I was uh, told, he just shut the door in the face of the missionary. Well, the missionary came back and knocked on the door again. And this happened a few times. My great-great-grandfather <clears throat> said that I will let you share in a few minutes your message. But you will stand over here. And he was a very wealthy man. He said, I will stand on my terrace, my patio. And you can tell me your message. And this was his message. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that if anyone would believe in him they would not perish but have eternal life probably a verse some of you don't remember the first time you learned that was the first time my great great grandfather learned. you know what he did he ran down from his terrace he put his arms around the white missionary and he said all of my life I thought I had to do things to love God. I never knew about God. He was saved. And a miracle took place in our family. And I think of it as a miracle because there's no reason why I should not have grown up in a Hindu home or anything else. The gospel came. The gospel came in to our family. And my mom and dad, through different circumstances, were saved. Believers. And so I grew up in a home where I never remember the first time I heard John 3.16. It was almost like I came out of the womb having it memorized, which isn't the truth, but I just don't remember ever learning. I never remember my first gospel meeting. I, rem I never remember some of these, even this verse in Isaiah 53, the first time I heard it. I was raised under the sound of the gospel. What a privilege when you consider the background. Well, we moved to the United States in the year 1993, and uh, my mom and dad left the city. I was just telling some people today at lunch. They left the city of 17 million people, the city of Mumbai, used to be called Bombay, and they moved to Alpena, Arkansas, a city of 17 million cows. <laughs> Maybe not much else. And you want to talk about a cultural shock. It was so different. It was so strange. And I remember growing up, and uh, we lived quite a distance from the meeting, about an hour and a half. We lived in Missouri, and we took the drive all the way across the Arkansas border to Alpena. A little church gathering, maybe 10 people. The Sunday school was just up, just a Sunday school treat. Thus. And uh, I remember thinking that this is just insane. I just thought that this was absolutely crazy. And I remember when I was going to school and many of my friends would be going over to various houses for Thanksgiving and Christmas and different parties. And my family, we just stuck to it ourselves. And sometimes got together with various people from these, this town an hour and a half away. I remember one time when I was just young, maybe eight years old, I asked my dad at the dinner table. I said, like everyone goes to their family. Everyone goes and gets together at Thanksgiving with their family. Like we don't get to do that. Where's our family? And of course, our family, as far as by the flesh, was thousands of miles away. But this was the response of my father. He said, Joey, the Christians are our family. Christians are, and they will. They have. Because you see, when you move away thousands of miles, and you might have hundreds of first cousins, and you come to a little place where there's no one, and here's my mom and dad with nothing in common. Al and Marta shut. Pro bridges, different things, nothing. 
except for us. It became family. And I didn't understand it, but I have come to understand it. Pretty much. Well, I never <clears throat> remember the first time feeling so much that I was a sinner or learning that. I grew up knowing that. Like some of you young men here in the front, I knew from the youngest age that I was a sinner. And Dad reminded me in different ways. And uh, I don't need to go into the various things I did, but I wasn't the perfect little kid. I knew how to put on the front in front of the right audience and in front of mom and dad to be a certain way. But when you get on the school bus and you're away, to behave a little bit differently and to do different things at the school. And I remember thinking to myself that uh, whatever this is, like, it's so strange. Because you have to remember, it was just like 10 people. It wasn't a big crowd like what's here tonight. It was 10 people who did this every Sunday. And it didn't seem like very interesting or attractive. And I thought to myself, that's the last place I went. But every night, mom and dad would pray. And all of us as a family would have our family prayers, as we call it, singing a hymn, reading from the Bible, and praying. And sometimes, as a little kid, I would peek over and see, and look. And when dad was praying, he would really be praying. It wasn't like a ritual or a form. And when mom was listening and praying along, she would be really praying like this. And I thought to myself, whatever this is, it's something real to them. I don't remember any great discussion at family prayers, except wanting to go away. But all I remember is this, these, there's something real about this to these people. Anyway, I knew that I was a sinner from hearing the gospel preached. I was drugged to every gospel meeting like this. I would have been in a meeting like this if I was within an hour and a half. And uh, I, was, I was preached by various different preachers. And I can't remember any specific thing they said. But I knew that for my sin, my personal sins, my lying, my theft, my swearing, I knew that for my sin, God would have to punish me. While he will punish murderers, while he will punish adulterers, I knew that he must punish liars. It was drilled into me that the Bible standard for sin is not the soul that murders will die, but the soul that sins will die. And so I learned from a very young age that I will be held accountable for my sin. But I always thought that there would be lots of time. And so I went through a very kind of laissez-faire attitude about sin and about salvation. And I would get worked up sometimes in various meetings or if somebody distant relative or some connection would die or maybe if there was a war going on somewhere and thinking that the lord jesus could come but nothing really troubled me too much um as i said it was a very small place i was the only we were the only ones in the sunday school so when they would pray as they do for people who come to the meeting and when they would pray for people to be saved they would pray for like two people that was me and my brother and so it was very uncomfortable to listen to your own name, only the, you're the only one prayed for. So I remember when I was about nine years old, I just told him I was saved. And I knew all the language. Jesus died for my sins. And I have a very special verse, John 3, 16. And uh, yeah, I, I'm saved. But uh, didn't really fool anyone. Didn't fool me. You know, can I just tell you something? It's a real thing to be saved. It's not some kind of an outfit you put on to kind of blend. It's a real thing to know peace with God. It's a real thing, as we've just been talking about in the previous meeting, to rest on a solid foundation. And to know sins dealt with. To know peace with God. To know all is well for eternity. But uh, anyway, we moved <clears throat> in the year 2000 to the state of Michigan, where I am currently living. And... Uh, the year 2003, shortly after the towers went down, President Bush, the then president of the United States, uh, stood up and he announced that the country was going to war against terror. And uh, the planes were setting off to Iraq. And I remember thinking, like, what's going to happen? I had always in all my life heard that uh, when the Lord comes, uh, of course, this is talking about now when he comes to reign. But when he, when he, I, I heard the verse that when he comes, there will be wars, rumors of wars, and the, and the whole country and various countries, I'm sorry, will be in chaos. 
But this was now our country, the United States, that was going to war. I was just wondering, like, what is happening? So I came home. And I remember I was in the kitchen. And mom and dad were sitting there. And it was just after the announcement. And dad was not worried about the war. He just said to his wife, my mother, you know, before the first plane takes off, Jesus said, they didn't say that to scare me. They said that because they were enjoying it. That's good. I remember thinking to myself, before the first plane takes off, Jesus could come. And I got to tell you, if it was scary in 2003, in the year 2021, with everything going on in Israel and everything going on in the Koreas, China, Russia, America, I would just tell you that knowing yourself safe is of utmost importance. Knowing yourself ready for the, any moment of turn of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I had heard testimonies like this all my life. And so for me, I thought being saved was something like this. I'll get it when I want to get it. And it was like a strange bridges, various testimonies that I would try. And I would flip the switch, the light would come on, I'd be saved, ready when Jesus comes, never be in hell, never have to deal, never have to be punished for my sin. And so I uh, went up to my room, very burdened, Jesus is coming, I'm not ready, very burdened. And I got down on my knees, because that's what I heard other people did. So I got down on my knees, I opened up the Bible, that's what I heard other people did. So I opened up the Bible, first verse, John 3.16. Somebody said in their testimony, what I did is I put my name in John 3.16. So I tried to do that. On my knees, there I was. For God so loved Joseph baby, that he gave his only begotten son for me. That if I believed in him, I will not perish, but have everlasting life. And I said it sincerely. And I said it with conviction. But it was like flipping the switch. The lights didn't turn. So, so then I went over to Romans chapter 5. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And there was a preacher there in Jackson who used to always say, and the ungodly is me. So I said that. The ungodly is the ungodly one. And I flipped the switch. Light stayed off. And I went through a number of different things like that, a number of verses. And I don't know if I can explain this to you in the way it was for me. But you know when you're in a dark room and you have a whole string of switches and all of them are supposed to work but they're not working the room doesn't feel darker or the room doesn't actually become darker but it feels dark and every time you flip it no powers nothing's happening and i thought to myself here i am i know i deserve to be punished for my sin that's the only thing that kept being impressed upon me from all of these verses i would read john 3 16 and nothing about god's love would impress me all that all Perish. All that would strike me in Romans 5 and 6 is ungodly. And there was no one. I was only 11 years old. I got up off my knees, closed the book, fell across my bed. And I thought to myself, there's no salvation. For me. I can't figure it out. I can't understand how these verses or what God has done can ever do anything for me. And as I fell across my bed, there was a verse I learned in Sunday school that came right into my mind. But was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my sins. The punishment was on him. So I can have peace and with that stroke, I am healed. I remember thinking to myself, is that all it is? Jesus died. For me. And I was saved in a moment that that's what happened on the cross. He settled my debt of sin, my punishment for my lying, my stealing. My punishment was taken by him, but he. And I say reverently today because it's just the only way I can uh, picture it. 
after I had tried all my light switches and shit, just on the mercy of God, he flipped the light. And the light is shone. There's a verse, and it says this, that he has shined light into our hearts in the face of Jesus Christ. And the light has shined in my next day. Hey, I opened up John 3, 16. I didn't have to put my name. I see it clearly. I opened up Romans 5 and 6. I didn't have to do anything. It was right there. Christ had died for me. You see, what happened that day was it was my sin that was separating me from God. The reason I would be left behind was for my sin. But he was wounded for my sin. That's what the Bible said. I rested on what God had said. And I was saved. I had many doubts after that. Many doubts. Wondering, did I repent enough? Did I believe enough? Has my life changed enough? It always comes back, even to this day. But he. But he. Friend, today, listen. Salvation is in Christ alone. There is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. If a person is to be saved from their sin, and everyone in this tent must be saved from sin, or perish. It is found in God who has given his son to take the penalty, to die for sin, to rise again the third day, conquering sin. And that you tonight were to place your faith, your confidence, to rest on him based on what God's word has said, you too would be saved. And so I'm a preacher, I suppose, like this crazy man, Legion, who was saved and went and told what great things the Lord had done for you. And he could do the same thing for you today. He could change your life. This is not about religion. This is not about church. This is about the life given. Transforming power of Christ to take a life broken and miserable. That could happen to you, not through a big process, right here at the CPC. Trust me, Lord Jesus Christ. Hard not to be smiling following that. Thank you very much. Would you turn please to John chapter three? John chapter three. The last verse in the chapter, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son, that is the Son of God, hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth. Fifty-five years ago this weekend, God saved me from hell. So I'm going to tell you how that happened. It will not be as exciting. It will not be as interesting as what you just heard. It's going to be somewhat prosaic, but to me it means everything. I have a book home, uh, Chronicles of the 20th Century, and you can look up all the important events that happened in the 20th century. There is nothing in that book about my being saved on a July night in 1966. It doesn't mean anything to others. It means everything to me. So I would like to tell you how that happened. My grandfather came from Italy at the turn of the century. And uh, he was either going to go to Argentina or to Philadelphia. So decisions were made long before I was even thought of that would have a tremendous impact on my life. I chose Philadelphia. He basically came with nothing but the shirt on his back. When he got to the, the ship, the board, there were uh, stevedores and others helping people with their bags. Somebody offered to help him with his bags, and he never saw them again. He just walked away with the bag. So he had nothing when he got to Philadelphia. But eventually he met a man named Mr. Caesar Patrizio. And Mr. Patrizio gave him one of the greatest gifts you could ever give a person. He gave him a Bible. Now, my grandfather believed that the Lord Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. 
He believed that he lived a perfect life. He believed that he was turned over to Pilate, that he was condemned, and that in the governorship of Pontius Pilate, he was crucified between two thieves. He was buried in Joseph's new tomb. He rose again, and he ascended to heaven from where he will return. He believed all of that. What he had never heard in his life, what he never knew, is what you just heard tonight. And it's right here. That word here. Have. <laughs> he never knew that God said you can have eternal life now. He never knew that it would be possible for a human being to know here and now where he will be there and then. That he could have everlasting life. When he read that verse, it was stunning to him. To realize that it wasn't his religion that could get him to heaven, but that Christ had come into the world to provide salvation so that he could have everlasting life. As a result of that, his children were brought up hearing exactly what you heard from my dear brother in a Sunday school and in gospel meetings, hearing how they could be saved. His firstborn was my mother. And in a gospel meeting like this, if I have the story correctly, she stood up before the meeting was done, turned around and said, I'm to her father and others. I'm saved. And so the gospel had come in, into our home before my mother was married, had come into the home. And that meant that when she became married and had children, we heard about salvation through Christ. Now, about 50 miles to the east, Philadelphia, there is a town or a city called Atlantic City. My father, who is of an Irish background, was brought up in that area, a place called Absecon. And he was in Atlantic City one night, and there were some Christians having a gospel meeting outdoors, just standing on the street corner, preaching the gospel. One person would speak, and then another would speak, and somebody else was handing out gospel papers. And he had never heard a message like that in his life. And so when the meeting was done, he went over to one of the men and he said, where, where, where are you people from? Where, where, where can I hear more about this? And they said, well, we're from the Atlantic City Gospel Mall. And you'd be more than welcome to come. And they told him about the time of the meetings. And so he began to attend the gospel meetings. One night after a gospel meeting, he went home went home to share in a room with his younger brother, Jack. And uh, I used to hear him tell how he was saved. He went into the room and turned on the light. Now, Jack was already in bed. And Jack rolled over and said, Al, turn off the light. And my father said, I'm just going to be a minute, Jack, just one minute. And he got down on his knees with the Bible in front of him. And he simply told God that if this is what you say, I'm trusting your word and I'm trusting your son. And my father became he met my mother at a conference or a meeting of some kind. Now, if there are any young men here and you're looking for a wife, I'm not going to recommend this as a pickup line. Um, but he went over to her and he said, never met her before. And he said, you're an angel. Turn around and let me see if you have wings. <laughs> it must have worked because they got married. They had three children. My uh, sister was the firstborn, then my brother, and then I came along. I remember the gospel particularly from a series of gospel meetings in 1963. The assembly had moved from, we were in a meeting in a building in Camden, and they moved to a new building in Pensacola. And that is basically as far back as I can go in my memory that that was, I recall, uh, being at Camden for a few years and then Pensacola. Two gospel, two gospel, one from Jackson, Michigan. The late Mr. Uh, McBain, Lord McBain, and then the late Mr. Uh, Eric McCullough preached the gospel. It was customary when the meeting was done, you would shake hands with the preacher. There were no COVID fears then. You'd shake hands with the preacher, and he would often give you a gift. That was something I was used to. But there was a, this night. That night when I left the meeting, Mr. McBain said, would you please fill that out and return it to me? I put it in my 
pocket. And when I got home, I pulled it out and looked at it. I can remember exactly where I was. I went into my grandmother's room because no one was in there. I could just be all alone by myself. I sat on the side of her bed and I looked at that page. It was white paper with blue ink. And this is what it said. If I die tonight, my soul will be in. There was a letter H and a blank line to finish the word. If I die tonight, my soul will be in. And the paper was supposed to have an answer. Kevin, I'm going to be honest with you. I picked up the pencil a couple times to try to fill in the rest of the word. I knew if I was going to be honest, Mr. McBain was not the kind of person you could be dishonest with. I knew if I was going to be honest, I was going to have to write hell. There had never been a moment in my life when I had been converted to God. I knew the Bible. I believe the Bible was the word of God, but there was no moment in my life when I was born again. And the Lord Jesus said, you must be born again. Except the person is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If I stop right now, that means that I've been born again. Do you have a moment like that? There may be many things about you that are assets, that are positive. You have never been born again. The Lord Jesus says, if you're not born again, you cannot enter heaven. To be born again is to have everlasting life. I didn't get saved in those meetings. I never filled out that paper. I never returned the turn. He never asked me for it. I'm very thankful he never asked me for it. I filed it underneath all of the tracks they gave me in the drawer beside my bed, left it there, never filled it out. There were a couple of occasions that should have been a loud voice to me. Somehow, I got through them without my soul. My grandfather was attacked. Philadelphia at night was not always a safe city to be in. He was attacked. He never really recovered from that. He died. I was walking to school one day. Uh, I was just at the corner and was as far away from what I'm about to tell you as perhaps the any tables with the refreshments on them. And I heard it sounded like firecracker. <laughs> and I stopped and I looked and there was a woman on the ground and she had her hand raised as if her hand could ward away the bullets. And there was a gentleman standing over her and he was clasping the gun in two hands, not because he was a marksman, but because his hands were shaking so much, so steady his hands, and he just kept fire. I was stunned. All he had to do was look up and get rid of the prime witness. But he never looked up. He strode across from her into his house, slammed the door, and then I heard another shot. He attempted to commit suicide, failed, and there'd be many days where I'd be subpoenaed to go to court. She died. Eventually, he died in prison. You would say, well, now that really spoke to you, didn't it? That, that made you think about how short life is and why you need to be saved. I never thought twice about my soul. I was completely unresponsive. I learned how to sit in a meeting like this with eyes open, head forward, and be miles away. If you're doing that tonight, I wish I could say something that would break that cycle, see, and would make you think tonight seriously about what God is telling you. Just fast forward then to the year 1966. The Sunday night of that weekend was July the 10th. There's an afternoon meeting. There's a missionary visiting a man from Alaska named Mr. Tommy Thompson. And there had been a, an afternoon meeting for the Christians. So we were hanging around the whole area. He spoke and then we had a, a light meal. And then I was sitting in the car reading a book, waiting for the meeting to start. And I walked into that meeting. And the last thing in my mind, the last thing in my mind was that I would become saved that night. There wasn't a thought in my mind about God or my sins or heaven or hell or eternity or salvation. Not a thought. I sat on this side of the hall, just a couple of rooms from the back. I cannot tell you where he read in the Bible. I cannot tell you what points he had finely tuned and tailored and presented. 
I cannot tell you a thing that he said, except that in the course of that hour's gospel meeting, he quoted this verse just here. This is a faithful saying and worthy of everyone's acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And just that word sinners stopped me, caught me. And I thought to myself, well, I'm a sinner. And that, but I'm not saved. And that means if I die, I will be in hell. A couple of hundred years ago, there was a gospel preacher who described it this way. He called it the inundation of the eternal. A human being swamped, swamped, overwhelmed, inundated, flooded with the reality of the next world we're going to, eternity. That's exactly what happened to me in that meeting. I don't know what time it was on the clock. I can tell you that from that point on, I stopped listening to the preaching at all. And I turned through the Bible. I did exactly what you heard my dear brother say he did. I turned through the Bible and I employed every trick I could think of. I had listened to so many people tell how they were saved. In fact, the reason why I was very cavalier about salvation was because I thought I had it all figured out. I thought I knew exactly when I wanted to be saved. I thought I knew exactly how to become saved. So it was never urgent with me. There was nothing of an emergency about it. It was as though I had put it on a shelf. I didn't want it now, but when I wanted salvation, all I had to do was reach for it and I would have it. The trouble was that night I reached for it and the shelf was empty. Nothing was working. I put my name in verses. Nothing. I told God I was the worst sinner in the world. Nothing. I heard people say that they got to the point where they finally admitted they deserved to be in hell. So I gave that a shot. Nothing. And the next thing I know, the man is saying, shall we pray? I looked up. I could hardly believe it. The meeting was over. Now, I told you when I walked into that building that night, the last thing in my mind was salvation. In one hour's time, God and his word had so completely changed my thinking that when I left that meeting, salvation was the only thing in my mind. We had a 20-minute ride from New Jersey to Philadelphia where we lived. All the way there, I, I, I just thought to myself, if I could just get alone, if I could just get alone with God and the Bible, maybe God would show me how to be saved. I, I, I had no idea what to do. If you've ever heard of the Bible word lost, that's exactly what I was that night. I was thoroughly, totally, completely lost. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to be saved. I didn't know what else to do or say. I was lost. The only glimmer of hope was that if God would show me, may, maybe, maybe I could get salvation that night. My brother was already married. My sister was away. The third floor was mine. July that year in the city of Philadelphia was brutal. So wherever you think you live where it's really hot, the heat and humidity in Philadelphia can kill you. And uh, our backyard was concrete. My grandfather had a just a small patch of grass with a fig tree growing there. It was Italian, fig tree growing there. But people would sit either on their front steps or in the backyard to catch a breeze long before air conditioning. Or at least that we could afford. So there in the back, I went up to the room, shut the door. I wasn't in the habit of praying. I hardly knew how to pray. But I got down on my knees by the side of the bed. I knew you were supposed to be on your knees. So I got on my knees. I still remember what I said. It wasn't very eloquent. I said, God, please save me. I don't want to go to hell. That was it. You must understand that God was under no obligation 
to save me. There are many times where he offered me salvation and I turned away from it. So why should God suddenly respond now that I wanted salvation? God could very easily have just left me. Now, if you are a mother or father and you bring your children to Sunday school, then I hope that this would be deep encouragement to you because I had hardly said those words when the verse I read to you flashed into my mind. I had learned it in Sunday school. And across the, the screen of my mind there came these words. He that believes on the son has everlasting life. That was like a slap in the face. I was stunned. I'll tell you why. Because there was one word as I was growing up. Here it is. There was one word when I was growing up that was thoroughly confusing to me. And it was believing. See, I did believe the Bible. I already believed that Jesus was the son of God. If you had pushed me, I would have told you I believe he died for me. So if I already believed, but I wasn't saved, then what? How do I become saved? And I made what could have been a fatal mistake of imagining the problem was in the level of my belief. If I could just believe harder, then I'd be saved. If I could really feel that I believed, then I would be saved. And so that's what I focused on. Whenever, and there were rare occasions, whenever I thought about salvation, the spotlight was on me. I imagined God watching me and waiting for me to finally do the right thing. And that if I, if I could just believe the right way, see, if I could just work up a sufficient faith, God would say, aha, finally, I can, I can accept that. I'll take your faith and I will give you my salvation. And of course, that never worked. You're all listening so well. I have to make sure I keep track of the time. But when I, when I thought of those words, as God is my witness, the thing that was stunning to me were just those two words, the son, the son of God, the son. That up until that point, I had imagined salvation was a joint effort between the son of God and me. He had done his part, and it was the vast percentage of it. But then God was waiting for me to do my part. And that's what I had constantly and futilely struggled with, never being able to do my part right. But there was God saying salvation was in his son. You know, I was going to tell you I was saved without thinking about it, but just in a moment's time, I just, I, I saw it and I accepted it, that salvation is all through Christ, through what he did. Not through me. I just I just believe what God said. I didn't have any happy feeling. There's no sense of a burden rolling off my back. I heard people talk about the joy and, and, and just feeling a burden gone, and there's nothing. So wherever this stuff came from, it came into my mind right at that point. That can't be salvation. That's too easy. So I reached for the Bible, opened it up to the words you read today, looked at them in black and white, and I thought to myself, no, that's in the Bible. <laughs> that's what God says. And that means I'm saved. Now, you want to talk about joy? I will tell you the overwhelming relief to know that I will never be in hell. It hit me. In fact, I remember lying awake that night for a long time, just the whole thing washing over me, just, just thinking it's all settled. I'll, I'll never, I'll never have to worry about my sins again. I will never have to fear meeting God. I will never have to dread dying in my sins. I thought about my parents down stairs and out in the backyard. So I went down the stairs and 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 opened the back door, and they were sitting out there. And my mother looked up, and my dad said, "What's the matter?" And I said, I just got saved. And my mother, you know what women are like. My mother threw her arms around me, weeping, prayed for this for so long. Thank God you're saved. And my father, with all the deep emotion of an Irishman, said, well, time will tell. We'll see what happens. <laughs> he died in 1980. I'm not sure even then he believed I was truly saved. But I, I uh, think my mother thought it. 
But it really didn't matter what they thought. Because I knew from the word of God. Christ had died for me. And at the moment that I trusted him, not myself, not my church, not my religion, not my prayers, not my good life. There was no good life to trust anyway. The moment that I trusted Christ, God gave me everlasting life. Now, you have to understand, I, I, I know I'm going to fail in communicating this to you in the next minute or so. But you have to understand, everything that I hold dear in my life. stems from that moment everything that means anything to me is all because at about quarter to ten on a july night in 1966 in the third floor back bedroom of a philadelphia row house i found out that jesus died for me and god saved me from hell I hope that you tonight will find out exactly what my dear brother and I discovered. But on that cross, Christ died not to help save you. Christ died for our sins. Christ died to save you from God.